so you grew up in a house of artists, an artistic household. Um, did you grow up with films? Yeah, I mean, my mum's a photographer and she teaches photography at a, film, at a photography school in Melbourne. So I was kind of around that as a child. And my dad was, a, he taught gold and silversmithing and things like that. So I think it was like part of the way I was raised. It was part of like, um, yeah, the household, I guess, um, was something I was always around. But I was, um, I don't know, the, we, the, the film thing was a different sort of, I don't, there wasn't anyone my mother had good taste yeah and she would watch a lot of movies but and so she would often like leave me movies to watch and kind of she kind of informed my taste and the things I liked in, in ways by just like making sure I watched all these things and having kind of a very specific thing that she loved um um so that was all a part of it but yeah someone I know that your mum introduced you to was Chantal Ackerman who you've mentioned has influenced some of your work what was it like watching Chantal for the first time um, when was that? I mean, I, th to be honest, it's sort of like it was an interesting. I think I saw Chantal Ackerman a little later, but I think the first film that like really struck me was the the Piano Teacher, the Hanukkah movie. Mm. And my mother left that on the stairs. She watched it and then she got it from Blockbuster and left it on the stairs, and it was just in the Blockbuster video case. And so I didn't know what it was, and I slotted it like into the thing, and it was like the hands on the piano and the kind of story that unfolded was like I was like, wow, I'd never seen anything like that film before so I think that was kind of the one that was like changed sort of the way I saw cinema and then I saw Jean, um, Jean Dillman maybe a few years later at, like in an installation like in a gallery played and you could just sit there and like, walk around and and that was kind of an interesting way to watch that movie which I didn't really think about at the time but it definitely came back when I made the assistant it was mm. a huge influence on that so oh, yeah yeah absolutely um wonderful and you began studying, so you went to art school in Victoria, studied film and TV, graduated, and then you went traveling around Europe. Is that right? That's sort of the, the time yeah. and events. What were you kind of seeking out when you decided to go traveling? Um, I don't know, I graduated from film school and I was making little documentaries um, at home in Australia and I was sort of looking for, I, I kind of was looking for, I guess to, I just was backpacking in the way that you do at that age. And then there was a point where I went to Ukraine. My mother's, my mother's Ukrainian, but my grandmother's Ukrainian, but my mother moved to Australia when she was four. So I always wanted to go back there. And I saw like this interesting kind of feminist movement there that I that kind of, it predated Pussy Riot. It was like the first sort of, um, of that kind of kind of feminist movement in that way, like radical um, kind of bizarre kind of actions. Um, so I, yeah, I sort of, I, I started, I just shot a, I saw them protesting in a park in Kiev and I started filming them. And then I ended up going back to Australia uh, and working, selling, you know, working in retail, selling bikinis over the summer because that was a good way to make money. And then saving up a bit of money to kind of go back and try and make my own little documentary there. So, so you were, were you still talking with the girls while you were back in Australia and then set it up? Yeah, I sort of asked them, like, I think I shot their protest and then at the end of it, I was sort of said to them, I gave it to them. I think I tracked down where they were. I shot a protest for them. I tried to shoot it as well as I could. And then I put, edited it together on my laptop and brought it like on a flash drive and gave it to them wherever they were hanging out. Someone told me they hung out at like a little cafe on the main square. Yeah. So I took that to them and they, um, and I said like, I'd like to shoot more of your protests and maybe make a documentary. And they were like, yeah, sure. Like anytime. In, Poor, like, broken Ukrainian. Like, I knew no Ukrainian. It was, like, really sloppy. Like, I'd pre-written those sentences out so that <laughs> I could make it work. And then they were, yeah, they accepted it and said yes. And so I went to Australia, made money. I think I was made about 10000 Australian dollars, which is what, you know, 5000 pounds. I used that money to spend, like, the year, essentially. I could live in a, for a year in Kiev on that, essentially. And so, I yeah, I went back with my camera and my laptop and my... And some audio, I bought audio equipment and some radio mics and all the little things I'd need to make a little doc. And, and yeah, and went off and I moved to Kiev, much to like my mother's. Um, she was a bit upset about it, but yeah. But if she wasn't then, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, which we'll get to. But I mean, what was it about Femin State uh, that they're sort of not calling card necessarily, but their method of protesting was to strip from the waist up and paint themselves with kind of slogans and messages. And then they'd, they'd take to person, uh, big public places to kind of push their message out there. But what, I mean, aside from the obvious kind of visual 
angle? What was it about them where you were like, I, I really want to see more of how they work? Mostly it was, it was visually really striking. Like <laughs> yeah. I hadn't seen anything like that before. And it was just like these wild protests. It was kind of messy, but they were trying and there was something really lovely about that, um, which kind of made me interested in it. And so I, yeah, I kind of, um, I took that on and kind of just ran with it. And to be honest, very quickly, I figured out there was a story there that it would work on like, not just a short, but like a long, a feature length story. Um, and I think I tried to get a bit of money, but I don't think anyone wanted to give me any financing. So <laughs> just did it myself and found that that was the best way to do it. And so I just, yeah, it literally, yeah, I just would shoot, shoot every day. I, I moved in with them when I arrived back and lived, there were six of us in an apartment in Kiev and I moved in there and like we would, yeah, and I would shoot their protests, which they protested once every few days. I'd shoot their protests and then I would edit their, give them the footage so they had something. And then I would kind of, in the on those days off, I would interview them or interview their families or kind of try and learn Russian and Ukrainian. <laughs> so, uh, which I did successfully, weirdly. Yeah. Um, that was a real immersion class. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of the way, the way in, I guess. And yeah, I was born out of that. We're going to show um, a, a clip that just cuts right to the core of, of what this documentary is. После розпаду Радянського Союзу Україна залишилася в кризі. Дуже багато жінок у 90-ті українок виїхали за кордон, щоб працювати в Європі і потрапили в борделі. Дуже багато українок було продано як рабинь, як секс-рабинь. Це ганьба для України, українок, що весь світ знає нашу країну як країну бордель що сюди їдуть туристи для того, щоб знайти собі повію. І ми вважаємо, що ми повинні протестувати проти цього. Ми повинні зробити все, щоб імідж України у світі був як країни, де голі жінки протестують, а не продають себе. проти патріархату і проти усіх його боїв. Протестуємо проти усього, що порушує права жінок. just a, a taste of what the girls were kind of undergoing every other day when they were doing the protests. You were obviously caught up in that as well. And I think one of what I seem to be one of the most challenging days was when you were abducted along with the girls when you were covering a protest um, by who was believed to be the KGB. I mean, how did that experience feel and how did that impact making the documentary? It was like... 
you got used to it. Like I was arrested eight times making that documentary. <laughs> and like they would just take us and arrest us. And I had this Australian passport, which got me out of everything. Cause it was just like, oh, I'm foreign kangaroos. And they'd laugh and like, let me go. So it became like this kind of fun game. And I feel like we got a little relaxed with it, I think in a way where, and then there was a point where we went to Belarus where the rules are different in Belarus and it was a little, they still have the KGB in Belarus. It's the only place where it still exists. Um, and actually we were protesting outside the KGB building, which is nuts. And so it was like, clearly we were like lined up for it, but they weirdly didn't take, they normally take, arrest the girls and then they arrest me afterwards. And in Belarus, they arrest the journalists because that's their way of stopping the message from getting out. So they took me first and there was two other Belarusian, uh, Belarusian journalists that were taken with me. And we were put in this van and I was trying to pretend, which didn't work at all, that I didn't know the girls. Like I was just on the street. <laughs> right. And I just happened yeah. to be there. And like, because I actually traveled separately than them in, in that case in Kate. We knew it was a bit risky. And actually one of the girls had written um, on my, the mobile number of the Australian consulate across my stomach in pen. So that if I got arrested or something, I could like see it and call, make a call, <laughs> which was insane. And I just thought it was crazy, but we did it anyway. And so, but they took me to this, like, in a van with these journalists. And the journalist said, oh, look, it's okay. It should be fine. It's a worry when they take you to the second location. And they, so we took us to the first location. And then, of course, they put us in a blacked out van and took us to a second location. And it got, like, really terrifying. And then I was sort of put in this cell for maybe 24 hours in the dark, like, with nothing. And they took everything away. And it was this bizarre feeling of being, like, bored and terrified but so bored that it's such a odd thing to kind of think through that you can't really be afraid because you're just so there's just nothing you know yeah. it's really weird um eventually I they brought this guy in who was a translator and it, it, it kind of got messy and they wanted me to sign these things and I was fingerprinted and I couldn't read what I was signing and it was like really awful and I eventually got to make a phone call to the consulate in Lithuania, I think that was the closest consulate, and they were they spoke the Australian consulate. They spoke to me about everything and kind of um, said that they can get me out of there and said I was free to go. But then the dudes who said I was free to go wanted to. Um, they showed me who's take like going to take me to the train station, and it was these two men that looked like henchmen. Like they were kind of, and I was like, I don't want to go. If I'm free to go, like just let me walk out of this building. Yeah. yeah. And they were like, No, these guys have to escort you to the train station. And I was like, But I'm clear of any charges right yeah. that they wouldn't let me go so it's like one of these terrifying things they go they go okay we'll call you a taxi but I knew taxis there are unmarked and so it was this awful thing of battling with them to just let me walk out alone and yeah eventually after like me fighting really fighting for that they they let me do it but people I had all these men following me I got on the subway and went to the train station and they were kind of following me everywhere there's people following me and I finally got on the train to go to Lithuania and I'm sitting on the train and thinking I was alone in the carriage. And I thought, well, finally, like, I'm, no one's here. And then this guy comes and sits down right in front of me and says, like, das Vidanya or whatever. Like, and, like, says, like, it just was so scary. And he stared at me for the entire train trip, trip for, like, it was, like, four hours oh to Vilnius. And, like, just watched me. And, like, whatever I did, he was watching me. And then it was, like, totally terrifying. Um, but, yeah, and then I arrived in Vilnius and, like, had a map to where the hostel was and like ran from the station to this hostel. And there's all these cute Lithuanians drinking mulled wine and like totally happy and like, what's going on? Oh, <laughs> and I was like yeah. covered in fingerprint ink and I hadn't eaten and I was shaking. And anyway, we somehow it was, <laughs> it survived and it was all fine. But I went, st I, the consulate picked me up and I, but I went straight back to Kiev. They were like fly home to Australia. Mm. And I was like, I've got to finish the documentary. So I went back to Kiev and shot for another six months and wow. kept going. But it was just like a life experience. Like it was, and by that time it's kind of became cool. You know, after you get over the terror of it, it's still, it's like, this is what I can tell this story at parties for years, you know? <laughs> so, but my mother wasn't happy, but everyone else was I was going to say, fine. she was upset yeah. when you went yeah, after exactly. that day. Yeah, my dad was very excited by it, to be honest. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it was fine. And it also worked to like, promote the movie like you end up telling that story and that se section is in I don't tell my side mm. of it but the girls were also taken in Belarus and their whole side of it is in in the film and so it was kind of good that you know it felt like we'd all shared that experience in a way and yeah 
Um, but yeah, yeah, it was a little tiny dock, by the way, and I like just cut it on my little laptop. You know, like it's a really yeah. small little thing, and so I'm proud that it's had this sort of life. And um, yeah, someone just like Magnolia, who owned it, the rights to it, just rebought it, which was nice to oh, like wow. feel like it's still got a place. It's they're gonna put it somewhere again, and so that's nice. And yeah. And then, how did you feel coming out of that? That is that is not your average first film to make. You know, abduction revelations you know violence um to come out of that and out the other side how did you feel I mean we, I, yeah it was we went I did film festivals for a year the weird thing about releasing that movie was I did film festivals for a year and I did I did a few and they did quite well but then then I think my darn happened there was some big moment in Ukraine politically and I can't remember if Crimea was taken at that point or where in the timeline exactly we were yeah. but some everything sort of changed in Ukraine after the release of the movie like just as soon as we'd released it it was like everything changed and all of a sudden everyone wanted ukrainian films so my film was in every festival so which meant i could travel with it which was great but my film doesn't actually address the conflict at all it's mm. sort of about pre-conflict which is felt felt odd considering the climate so i felt like i should go back to ukraine to make like a short film or something that addressed what was going on because i just made this one and yeah. I, I you know so it was strange to be out talking about ukraine and not yeah, so it, it ended up inspiring me to kind of just head back to Kiev and um, and trying to figure out what I could do there or how I could comment on what was going on in some way yeah, or what I could say or what, what needed to be said. Or it was sort of like I spent two months just sort of sitting around my old apartment with the girls that were still there trying to figure out what would be a good way to approach it, I guess, and what would, what they what they felt was needed at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And... You didn't make another conventional documentary like, not that there's anything especially conventional about Ukraine as a brothel, but you, you went down a very different route um, while you were over there. So the conflict was was breaking out um, and you decided to make a short documentary. It's called The Casting of uh, Oksana Bayul and it's um, a kind of short film made up of audition tapes of young local actors who are auditioning to play the lead in a biopic about her so uh Oksana she's uh at the time she was a young uh figure skater she was a gold medalist uh in the 1994 Olympics and she was kind of this like beacon of hope and and all things wonderful uh in Ukraine at the time uh we're going to show a clip of uh of the short documentary Меня зовут Маргарита, я пришла на ее Сане Боев. А говорите, чем я снимаю? А, меня, а, меня зовут Даша, мне 13 лет. Я занимаюсь бальными танцами, вокалами и занималась актерским мастерством. А, я увлекаюсь моделингом. Закончила модельную школу Viva Models. Там были очень интересные предметы, мне очень понравилось актерское мастерство, хореография, фото, видео, класс. Э, так, ну я ход, ну, ходила, буду ходить теперь в этом городе, в драматический кружок, э, э, рисую, учусь в художественной школе, буду тут учиться. Мир смеха, мир печали, мир надежды, мир потерь. Твой мир наш милый Чарли вновь нам открывает дверь. It was a fascinating concept. Like, how did you come up with that? Yeah, it was a confusing one. We were like looking at all the stuff that was coming out of Ukraine at the time. It was all this. It felt like it was all this war stuff, and we were kind of looking at. We thought well, there was a you know bunch. I was still living with a lot of those girls. We were talking about how it affects children and the fact that it, you know that no one really covers that and kind of and sort of the human side of that and how sad that was and so we were working with we worked with a drama school I just contacted a drama school in Kiev um 
and we were trying to figure out who was still like in town. Like, Kiev was pretty fine at the time, like, and we were, um, and we just contacted them and asked if we could do some kind of like exercises with them. Mm. And they, uh, yeah, they said, I said that they loved the idea of it because we just had this successful documentary. Um, and so, yeah, they lined up, <laughs> we sort of met a bunch of these kids and we were chatting about like what they wanted to do and dreams and roles and stuff like that. And then we kind of brought them all back to do this audition tape thing and, um, and got these little costumes made that they all put on and it was very adorable. And yeah, it was kind of like the idea was the movie is the audition tape. Like we said that straight away. Mm. Like there is, there's no move. The movie is the audition tape, but there's, there's a final scene where they play out the, the scene where she wins the gold medal and they all kind of cry and laugh and get flowers. And, and so we kind of, that was sort of the goal is you get to that point. And so, you know, it's very weirdly, we shot it in a day or two days, which is all the little girls that come in one by one and leave. And then, um, and I cut it together in a couple of days and then it went to Sundance and it won the Sundance prize. And so it was this thing of, I felt really bad for all the filmmakers who'd spent like, you know, years at war <laughs> today with these kids. And we, but it was like a nice, I felt like it kind of was a different way in, I guess, um, to talking about that sort of thing. I mean, how did it feel shooting at the time? Cause I, I read somewhere like the, the MH17 crash that happened like the day before you started filming was yeah, it? Yeah, so really that was tough weird because my cinematographer was on that Malaysian, not that flight, but like was on that flight the day before, the same flight the day wow. before Yeah, and then the next day he arrived because that flight goes, I think it was like somewhere to Holland and then Holland to Ukraine or he's, the pattern was what he did. So it felt very, everything felt very precarious and very scary. And I remember there was a point where my neighbor came over to our, knocked on our door and said, okay, look, if the Russians arrive tomorrow, like in Kiev, he said, you need this. He's so wild. He goes, okay, you need to grab a backpack, grab a white sheet, put it over the backpack, go down to the supermarket, get canned goods, cover the sh the backpack in the white sheet and like, and bring it home. And then keep doing that until you filled your kitchen with, with stuff. And I was like, is this seriously going to happen? Like, is this ha going to happen? And everyone's like, no, he's just, that's Misha. He's like crazy. Don't listen to him, you know? But it was like, it felt like it was on the edge of something, but that thing never happened, you know? So everyone was kind of living their lives with a few people feeling like a bit unsure. Um, but yeah, it was, it was safe at the time. Like it felt safe. And so, yeah, we didn't, we, we stuck around and had a nice summer in Kiev and stuff, but, um, yeah, it took a little while for it to escalate beyond that, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the structure, you obviously were very happy with how the structure worked because then you developed that into a, a feature-length film, which was Casting Jean Bonnet, uh, which was a, a similar kind of format on a much bigger scale, and it centred around, obviously, the, the Jean Bonnet Ramsey investigation that happened in 1996. Uh, could you tell me about how you developed that structure into a, a feature? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty because we won Sundance with it, everyone at Sundance is like, well, how can we make this in America? And what, how can this be American? And what do we do? And can we make it a feature? And like everyone wants to, when you win Sundance, people want that stuff from you. And I kind of just, without even thinking, probably just blurted out John Bonnet Ramsey because she's a little girl dressed up in the same way. Yeah. And so like the visual link was really clear. And then it was about thinking, oh, well, that might be an interesting way to explore grief and explore how uh, kind of a town coming to terms with that whole murder and what happened and and look at and kind of audition the town essentially to play the roles and to figure out where they were at the time and what that meant to them and how it connects to their life. And it was a little like armchair investigation, like who they thought did it. And like it kind of um, it just seemed to naturally fit a feature length sort of structure and we were able to kind of plot out different characters and talk about like the representation of women in by talking to the women who played the mother and like we we're kind of looking at different sort of aspects of the case that way. Um, so yeah, it kind of fit. And I went, I took my, I think I got a little grant from the Australian government this time. They finally gave me some money, I think. And um, I took that, I think it was like 10,000 again. And I took that to Colorado with my cinematographer and a production designer. And we just started shooting auditions and, similar to that um and then we used that reel to get the finance to do the full thing which was maybe not that much, wasn't made for much money at all maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars and then we sold it to netflix and like in post-production and then netflix gave us more money to add more glittery expensive sequences so they kind of we got this extra injection of funds from netflix and then but all of a sudden it was a tiny little documentary that we thought would play in like 
tiny little art house cinemas. Yeah. And all of a sudden it was like a Netflix original and everyone was watching it and there was a lot of eyes on it and it was kind of scary actually. And it was sort of a bigger deal than we thought it would be. Um, but yeah, so it was, that was kind of a big journey up with a t- little, little movie, you know, <laughs> but yeah. Something I wanted to ask you about the, the filmmaking with that, that I really like is there's little misplaced bits of set behind people as they're talking. Mm. I liked there's um, someone in a Father Christmas uh, and there's a reindeer on its side kind of in the back. Mm. What was the, the kind of filmmaking choice for that to have the misplaced I mean, we started with that audition sequence. So in the face of Ukraine, it's just this blue backdrop. But in John Bonnet, we sort of picked sort of a few items that would make each backdrop that thing. So the policeman has a, you know, like a filing cabinet and, a, you know, like there's a few, we gave the actors a few props as well just to play with and chat with them, different wallpapers. And then that sort of, we just built it out from there. And that kind of like, it just became this kind of real hybrid exercise of like what is the film that they're trying to make and what is the audition tapes and where is it documentary and where is it um, narrative and like playing around with the line of all that was really interesting and it kind of culminates in this big like dramatic sequence where all the actors get to play in this sort of house and um, and so we kind of built this big set um, to do that in and uh, yeah so it just kind of the form of it sort of in made that we made a lot of those choices based on kind of this kind of hybrid form I guess yeah and it went to Sundance as you said a lot of eyes on it It went to Sundance uh, and it was at Sundance you were doing press and you were asked some questions mostly by male journalists that kind of undermined your work on the film uh, there were these assumptions that the ideas predominantly came from your male producers um, and it didn't feel great, and that was kind of when the wheels started to turn on your fictional debut, which was the assistant. I mean, first of all, I wanted to ask why why fiction for this as opposed to continuing with your documentary. I mean, so well, it's because of that, like at Sundance, that was weird. Like the first question I got asked, I was so excited to be there with my feature documentary, and the first question I got asked was, "So who's really in charge? Like, is it Scott or is it James?" And they were my two male producers. And they were like, I was like, what do you mean who's in charge? And they're like, well, who gives you the ideas? And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, who gives the, who's coming up with the ideas? I'm like, well, you'd never ask a male director who's coming up with the idea. Like, it was just sort of wild. And I was kind of getting those questions all the time. And I, I often get journalists who walk in and see me and go, oh, you know how we had that 20 minutes scheduled? We, only, we don't need 20, <laughs> you know? We only need 10 and like walk, like just things like that. We just like, my kind of confidence just like ripped apart yeah. during like promoting that movie. Maybe because it was like complex and weird, but no one could really underst- make sense of the fact that I'd made it or yeah. something, which was really upsetting. Cause it was like, oh, I worked this hard and nobody thinks I really was in charge mm-hmm. of it. So I think there was like some like sadness or something attached to that, that or like anger maybe that I was looking at expressing, I guess. And so in taking on another project, um, it was like looking at sort of, I was honestly, it was like looking at sexism in the, in the film industry was kind of what I was interested in doing Mm. at the time. There wasn't much to really hang that on. So we started talking to, at the time, I think we were working on college campuses because they were talking at that, at that particular moment, it was like very much like all the Title IX um, sexual assault stuff was happening on yeah. campuses. And that's where they're chatting about that stuff and sort of developing language around how we talk about misconduct and stuff like that. So I went to a few college campuses to do like research on just figuring out what I wanted to say, but knowing that there was something in there that was interesting me. Um, and the Me Too story broke when we were at a college campus and I had friends that had worked at the Weinstein Company And I immediately started texting them about it and they were telling and just asking kind of women that I knew that worked there what they knew and and what it was like to work there as a woman. And and it kind of fed into like their frustration with what they'd been through there, fed into like my frustration with releasing the movie. And so I think those two things kind of came together and it it was like, okay, I've got a lot to say about this. Um, So let's make a film that's not only about, I mean, sexual assault which the assistant is about but is also about this kind of larger systemic issue which is like we're not letting women kind of in to this these spaces like it's really kind of hard they sort of the whole structure is against us yeah. and like trying to work out how to find your place in that and how to climb a, the ranks in that system is really messy and awful and um anyway so that kind of informed the assistant essentially and so I started interviewing I think I spoke to maybe at least 30 people that worked at the Weinstein Company or Miramax and then another 30 that worked at 
for Matt Lauer or the kind of other guys at the time. Um, yeah, there's a few of Scott Rudin, a few of them are still working, but, um, so I spoke to a lot of people like that and just gathered stories and honestly didn't go for the wildest stories, went for the most banal, the stories I heard again and again and again were the ones that were in the assistant. It's like, if I've heard it like five times, then it gets to go, then it's in the movie. So it's about this very routine, very everyday life of a female assistant in a production company like that. Um, and just how, how depressing and awful that could be essentially. Why, um, why yeah. was it that you went for those banal kind of the, the jobs of a bottom rung office person as opposed to the bigger things that people were telling you? I think that, oh, I mean, if you, if it's, I mean, I, I was also trying to point out that it's in every workplace. It's yeah. not just, and sometimes when you hear those Harvey Weinstein stories, they're crazy. They're like, well, the helicopter landed on the roof and there was a suitcase filled with money. And I'm like, that, that stuff's not going to, like, nobody's going to see themselves in that character. Yeah. So it became about, well, what happens everywhere? What can people, what's universal? What can people relate to? How can we just highlight this sort of structural inequality? Um, that became essential. Um, and still hopefully make a movie that's not totally boring, that still has tension in it. Um, and it still kind of feels works like a horror movie even though it's a very subtle quiet horror movie yeah, yeah. absolutely and it's so the character is uh jane who's played by the the wonderful julia garner um who yeah has this bottom rung position in a kind of nameless um i believe it's nameless nameless kind of uh place working for this predatory bully uh film exec and um so it was a an 18 day shoot i believe mm -hmm. what were you doing with because it's it's a film that just consists of those small details, doesn't it? Like and these tasks by rote that she has to perform. So what were you doing with Julia in the run up to, to that eighteen day shoot? Um, well yeah, we had to cast Julia, which was a big thing. And yeah. that was like we had a script that basically didn't have much dialogue in it. There's one I think we're gonna show a clip from it. That's the only dialogue basically in the movie. Um, the rest of it's her doing basically office tasks you know, using the photocopier and getting the coffee and all these sort of things and noticing weird things around the space, like, you know, a stain on the couch or, you know, things that are off-putting um, and trying to put the kind of put it all together. Um, so I needed someone who had like an interesting look, like a striking kind of face and felt kind of like, you know, that you wanted to follow. And I, um, I had seen her in the Americans and in Ozark and I just, every time she was on the screen, I was like, she's interesting. Like she's just, strange she's got a strange face yeah. and she's very expressive and there's something about her um so I'm, I got we got in, onto her agent and we met her for a coffee and it seemed to work she and I got along and she wanted to do it so um a second later we were kind of doing it we kind of threw into it really quickly we just went I think people were like wanting to go we want to go kind of secretly we didn't want people to know we were doing it the film industry were mad we were doing it so there was like a lot of like people didn't like the idea that there was a movie being made um, so we we're trying to secretly sort of do it, you know, without people noticing. And, um, she, yeah, we, I don't know, she didn't need to do, we didn't, we spoke a lot about the trajectory of the character, but she doesn't like to rehearse much. So we never do much rehearsal, but we did a lot of like technical, like she needed to learn how to answer the phone quickly and open a box, like stuff, like really like sounds silly, but she's got to look like she's done that thousands of times like not just like she's new and you know yeah she actually was really awkward with a box cutter and like teaching her to just open a box was like a big few hours of the day you know <laughs> things like that but um yeah so it was like trying to teach her the work stuff which we had to do in the royal to teach them how to ten bar as yeah. well um yeah it became kind of the bulk of it and then she's just so natural that you put her in it's sort of better to not give her too much like you just put her in front of the camera and stuff happens and it's always kind of magical and so I don't like to load her up with much, really. I, I'd love to know more about how you went about crafting this invisible man who holds such power in in every frame that you see. You kind of feel the weight of his kind of leadership and, and the way that he runs this company. It's like, could you tell me a little bit more about how you crafted this this invisible man, essentially? I think it was, we didn't want to have the, we'd we seen enough movies about bad men. We didn't want to have another bad man movie. I didn't want to have an, a rape sequence. I didn't, like, there was nothing. I was trying to make a film about something lo like a systemic problem. So it, he, well, he wasn't important. He wasn't relevant, really. Yeah. And just, he, we needed to feel the threat of him. We needed to sort of, know, the tension of just working for him and what that's like and how you carry that in your body was really important. But the actual his face and his body to me was just un not interesting also there's that kind of jaws idea that like if you never see the shark it's scarier than if you see the shark um so yeah we were sort of playing into that i guess um but yeah 
And the, uh, actually, to be honest, we've got in an actor to do the voice and the voice is scary. Like he does this great, like he sort of, <laughs> we brought him in to just read, yell at her on the phone and stuff. And he's an amazing guy. He was just like eating sandwiches and screaming. He's just like so messy and gross. And it was sort of like he's, yeah. So he brought this other level of like crazy to it. Yeah. And I wanted to come back to the funding because as you said, you were developing this in reaction, in part in reaction to the Weinstein scandal breaking. The, you know, it knocked the wind out of the industry. The dust had not settled by any means. And it still hasn't, but you know, it's not like at the wave now where things like she said are coming out. Like this was right after it happened. Um, how did you get this film funded? It was like impossible because no one, everyone would say, everyone liked the script. The script reads quite well and it's sort of tense, like is what's going on? What's going on in the next room? And, but everyone was afraid of it. And I think, but all the female executives at every company would say, yes, we love it. We're going to, we're going to have it. We're going to take it. I'm just going to show my boss tomorrow and then we'll come back with you with the number. And so we'd be all like, yes, okay, great. This company wants it. Excellent. And then the next day she'd write back, I'm so sorry. My boss used to work at the Weinstein company and we can't do it. Or mm. my boss, or we don't have a very good HR department here. And we're a bit <laughs> worried that we still highlight whatever the skeletons or whatever. In the end, I think we just got, we cobbled together bits and pieces of money from just people that were wanted to help um like a there's like a, a female-led organization called level forward and they gave us some that abigail disney has a hand in and they gave us some money and we got so we got bits and pieces and then we sort of just made it very cheaply so i was 18 days and it was all in one location essentially and yeah it was very it was sort of done pretty quickly and cheaply for sure yeah speaking of bad hr we are uh, gonna show a clip from the film this is when jane sort of musters up the courage to try and report her boss and she goes to uh, the head of their HR department, his name's Wilcock, and he's played by Matthew McFadden. Uh Let's, I'm going to, this clip really stresses me out, but we're going to, we're going to watch it now. <laughs> Entry-level jobs in this industry are tough, right? Long hours? Yeah. But... First one in, last one out? Well, yeah. I bet you haven't seen your friends in a while. Um... I missed my dad's birthday. It's tough. Yeah, but Where do you go to college? Uh, Northwestern. It's a great school. It's a great school. You're smart. You have to be smart to get into Northwestern. Plus that 3.8 GPA. And you're on, a, you're on a fast track in this business working here. You are. So, what's your plan? Sorry? Where do you want to be in five to ten years? Oh, uh, I, I want to produce. I want to be a producer. You do? Yeah. <laughs> that's, okay, that's excellent. We could use more women producers. You know, that's a, you, it's a tough job, but I can see that you've got what it takes. Thanks. So why are you in here trying to throw it all away over this bullshit? Sorry? This, whatever it is, let's make it official and call it a complaint. Let's assume I were to do the disservice of writing it up for you. So your complaint is as follows. The company hires a new assistant. She's young and in your opinion, she's very pretty and she's maybe a little she's inexperienced. A exactly. A They've possibly offered her a job just like that and they're putting her up in a fancy hotel. And you live, where do you live? Astoria. Astoria? <laughs> okay. I understand. That's not the point. And by the way, how experienced were you when you got hired? A couple of internships, am I right? The last one paid me. Do you know Do you know how many people work at this company? I have to make sure all of them are taken care of. And you know how many people want to work here? I've got 400 resumes teed up for your position alone. Ivy League grads, 4.0 GPAs. And here you are, sitting in my office, stressed out, jealous of some new assistant who's who's getting more attention than you. I'm I'm not not jealous. I I was just I was worried for this girl. She's a woman. She's a grown woman. Sorry, yes. You think a grown woman can't make her own choices? I never said that. Because she's a waitress. I nope, I didn't. What I didn't then? Say that. What then? Listen, honestly, what do you want from me? I understand that was 
as you say, that was that was the scene with, with the most dialogue in it. I understand that was a, a bit of a tough one to execute in terms of getting that horrible power imbalance just, just right. Could you tell me a little bit more about executing that scene? I actually don't think it was that difficult. I mean, Matthew's so awesome. <laughs> like, he's so brilliant. And like, I don't know, it was sort of, I mean, I guess the versions of the script were, we made him angrier at first and then it felt like silly to make him angry. It felt creep. It was creepier if he was kind. Do you know what I mean? There's something really awful about that sinister kind of kindness with with which, and he's sort of trying to be on her side and like the the we need more women producers line. Like oh, I I love that. <laughs> it's just so <laughs> cruel and like so awful. But um, he yeah, there's something about what he did. I don't know. So the two of them did that. It's a 12 page scene, and we did it in a day. And just every take was so great. It's like when you get that kind of the nice thing about. It, I just worked with like. I hadn't worked with experienced actors before and I was given those two and they just, every take was amazing, you know. Mm. And it's that thing of going, it's hard to, and we actually, with Julia, she was so worked up that she cried and she actually cried less and less and less and we used the later takes where she wasn't crying as much. Yeah. And Matthew kind of got, I think it started really hot and then it got more and more gentle and that kind of became a little more cruel and, and sort of we found this really nice balance in the end. But um, it because they're so good, it, it wasn't that difficult. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. great. And you were saying that uh, it's been picked up by the New York Commission, like commissioned to be shown to people who yeah. are taking on jobs now in, in New York. It's like a... We're proud of that. It's like the, yeah. the New York City like Commission of Human Rights asked if they could use it in their sexual harassment training video. So everyone that gets a job in New York City has to watch clips from the assistant <laughs> before they take a job, which is amazing. So I still get texts from people going, hey, I got this new job and I'm watching, you know, the assistant, which they love because, like, everyone's excited because the guy from Succession is in their <laughs> sexual harassment video. <laughs> but um, it's really it's really cool that we're able to kind of highlight. We're highlighting these tiny things. Like, it's not about, like, it's really about these little moments mm. and the idea that they can pick up on that and show that to people and they can have that use, like a wider use in society is really lovely. So, yeah. Amazing. I'd love to keep talking about it more, but we have just blitzed through this. Um, we've got about five more minutes and then we're going to come to some questions. So please think about what you'd like to ask. Uh, but we've got to talk about The Royal Hotel, your yeah. latest uh, film, which is coming out here in a few weeks. Uh, you're reunited with Julia. Um, she plays uh, an American traveling around um, Australia with her friend Liz, played by Jessica Henwick. Uh, and when they're strapped for cash, they take a pub job in the outback uh, in a mining town um so you wanted to work with julia again and cecil films they wanted to work with you after the assistance you had production company you had your style but but where did the story come from uh it was i was i don't know i wanted to make something in australia my mom wanted me to make something in australia she was like you're an australian filmmaker it's embarrassing that you haven't made anything <laughs> in australia so i thought okay maybe i should um and i was looking for the right subject and I didn't know how, I didn't know, I, you know, if you're going to make something in Australia, you want something that I can acknowledge the, or shoot the landscape and have that sort of element too. And so often I find subjects but they never felt like the right thing. And I was watching this documentary, I was on a documentary jury and I watched 10 Australian documentaries and one of them was about Scandinavian girls working in an outback pub and they were like serving the miners that, work, that, that lived in this town and it was them trying to, basically understand the culture and but also just deal with the bad behavior of the dudes in, in this town and I thought it was interesting to look at Australia through their eyes and mm. that was like I hadn't seen the outback that way like represented that way so I um I also thought Julia could play the lead which made sense I was like this is like a perfect role for her um yeah so I pitched it at seas to seesaw and they liked the idea of it and I brought on a co-writer I wanted someone who lived in, in regional Australia to like Kind of give it that really lend that more authentic voice i'm from melbourne so that's not my town although my granddad owned a regional pub my dad grew up in one i have so i have some connection to it yeah but it's not fully my world in that way um so yeah i brought on oscar and the two of us kind of built this script I brought, sort of like the inspiration was the dot but there's not a lot that we've taken from the dot we sort of made it our own in a lot of ways um yeah, it's it's an interesting dynamic between Hannah and Liz as well. Um, Hannah's obviously very cautious, and uh, Liz is not. Liz is Liz. Liz so Liv, sorry, Liv is more rowdy, and they've got the foundations of a great friendship, but just very different spirits. Like, how did you land on that dynamic? Yeah, they have a. I mean, it's interesting. We had to cut. I had had Julia in mind, and it was figuring out who her best friend would be. 
Um, and I knew traveling, there's always one, when you travel in, in a pair, there's always one person that has to like look at Google Maps and like figure out where you're going to stay and figure out how much things are going to cost. And, and there's one person that can be a little looser. And um, uh, my friend Eleanor, she'd hate that I'm naming her, but she's always the one that's a little drunk and I'm always having to look after it. Um, so it was a little bit going, oh, okay, well, who would be that? How do I kind of represent that dynamic on screen? Um, and so, yeah, we, we needed to a fun friend and um, we found Jessica, who's a fabulous actor, but also felt like our people and like she'd get along with us and um, managed to kind of convince her to come and do it with us, which was fun. Um, she's British too, which made, I think she understood the kind of Australian culture a little more and so slipped nicely into that role in a way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, that seemed to work. The, the challenge was Julia and I are so close and we, that it was always like, if we bring in a third person, are they going to feel left out? Like, and how do we find someone that fits? And I think Jess somehow, like I was, when I was casting, I was like looking for not just like a good actor, but someone that would fit in mm. and she has sort of had all those elements and yeah so it was really fantastic amazing I've got one more question and then we'll come out to you guys um but it is definitely more of a departure from your documentary filmmaking I feel like than the assistant it leans further into genre sometimes it just feels like a white knuckle horror like the way that it's framed sometimes the lighting was that a decision that you wanted to lean more into kind of genre filmmaking or um I mean, it, to be honest, we had to fight the setup, which is like as soon as two women with backpacks appear in a remote setting, yeah. you think they're going to die. Like everyone just thinks they're going to die. So it, it sets itself up as a horror, even if we didn't want it. To, you know, like we had yeah. to, we were constantly working against that. And still in doing that, we would have, we had visitors to the set who would come and watch a scene. And it was just the girls working in a pub. I remember someone from the Australian government came and she leaned over and said, oh, it looks great, darling, but, like, why do the girls have to die? And I was like, they don't die. And she's like, they don't die? Like, I just assumed they die. And, like, you have to challenge that. It's so weird. But literally she saw a scene of them having drink, serving a beer in an outback. So the idea that we didn't kill them is kind of wildly <laughs> radical to, like, an audience. But so we just had to kind of in setting it up, you know, it will naturally fall genre, at least for a little while. Yeah. But then it becomes its own thing. And we sort of becomes about something I'm trying to say, say some some bigger kind of look at a cultural kind of thing, bad behavior, alcohol fueled aggression, weird sort of encounters you have as a woman when you feel uncomfortable in these spaces. But you're not sure if you should speak up or not. You're not sure if that's makes you look like a prude or if you say that that guy makes you uncomfortable so it's sort of about all that awkward that kind of aw those awkward interactions you have um often in those spaces male dominated spaces but also just drink like when there's too much alcohol and everything's a little loose um yeah so yeah 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 all right let's go to some questions we've got a roaming mic we've got a hand up just there So like it's the nice thing about being Ukrainian, my mother being Ukrainian, is immediately Ukrainians accept you. As soon as I say my mother's Ukrainian, everyone's like, oh, you're Ukrainian then. Why? Are you, you're not Australian, you're Ukrainian, which is nice. And so it, it felt like immediately I was accepted. Um, it was 10 years ago. I don't know now, maybe it's a little different, but it was 10 years ago that it felt like m more of an okay thing to do. I, I mean, I'd probably think twice probably before I dive into making something about what's going on right now. But, um, but yeah, no, it felt at the time it felt okay. And those girls, I, the thing about the, I've, I've had a friend actually who just watched, I was a friend who made a great Ukrainian film this year. I get, he was asking me about my Ukrainian film. I sent him the, um, Ukraine is not a brothel. And I was sort of saying, oh, I made it 10 years ago and I don't know if it works. And, and he watched it and said, no, they trust, there's so much love for you. And that your relationship with them is really clear in that movie. Like you can see they direct, they address me directly and you can see that, that bond. And I think that that, I mean, it's evident in the film and I, I get, it was something that I worked hard on to get that trust. Again, as same with the drama school in Kiev as, well as I feel like it's about those relationships and making sure you're there and have it. And I give everyone my number and everyone my email and like try and make sure I can stay in touch with every single person if anyone has concerns. So like, it's, it's just about just making sure you're doing it in the right way, I think, and approaching things in the right way in that sense. And then, and then you're okay. And, and getting the right collaborators who, not understand the world, you know, that are from there and get what it's, you know, and get what you're saying and know that it's in the right space or whatever, or you're, you know, it's sort of the key, I think.
the, the way I do it, and this is a very broad, broad, it's like I kind of have an idea with the script. You can kind of, I like to pre sort of visualize everything and figure out what I need. I almost watch it in my head before I've made it and I kind of know what I need. And then it's just about figuring out how to get what you need on the day. So it's like, and every act is different and it becomes about their, them and just what do they need to get there. And so there's things like Hugo Weaving loves rehearsals and wanted to rehearse everything and wants every detail, wants to know what every line means and has this beautiful script. I saw his script on the set and it's filled with these like notes and like post-its are like just gorgeous and like clearly like so much detail. Julia barely reads her script. She's just like, whatever. You know? <laughs> but there's something about going, okay, that works for her. That works for him. And it's really about figuring out who each person is, what, and just, and I'm kind of like, just give it over. Like, I'll just do whatever they need me to be, to have, you know, do it in their way. Um, and so, yeah, it sort of depends on the thing, but it's sort of also being clear about what, to be honest, clear about what the scene is about or who's seen M. Night Shyamalan, I worked for him for, with him for a bit, and he always says, whose scene is this? Like, who's at, Who's got the, who's, like, the stakes are higher for who? Like, who's sort of in the most jeopardy or whatever? That becomes the person whose scene it is. And then it kind of works that way. It's going, like, well, what do I need? At? Where where are the stakes? What do I need? What beats are important? And then kind of letting the, letting the little things slide because you're like, well, if we've got X, we're okay because we have to move. A lot of it's about... At the budget level I'm at, it's always about we have to move on. So, like, what's the essential things that we need to get? And then it becomes, yeah, so it's really kind of becomes more pragmatic at the end of the day and just, yeah, I don't know. It's sort of a tricky one, but it's it's, it's just, yeah. Also, by the way, on the Royal, it's like there's 14 actors in every scene and every single one of them wants attention. And part of it becomes balancing that and trying to go, trying to make everyone feel seen and everyone feel like they're doing a great job, even though you can't even see what some of them are doing in that frame because it, it's too busy or whatever. Um, so it's a little bit about working with their own egos and like making sure everyone feels loved. And um, yeah, there's a lot of that in with, with, with the non-real people that are actors, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, it's such a weird one because it's like you finish a movie, I'm in that position right now, and then you have to think about, well, what's next? And I think I like to respond to whatever I've, whatever has come before me. And this, the Royal Hotel came out of a lot of people accused Julia's character in The Assistant of being weak. And again, like we got all this positive press, but I'm fixated on <laughs> the review that said she's weak. And I'm like, well, I'm going to fix that in the next one, you know, or that she doesn't have any friends. We got that in for the assistant. So it's like going, okay, well, let's give her a friend. Let's make her strong. <laughs> um, but so it kind of is like, I feel like also it's hard to like think about what you want to make. So really, if anything can inspire you, even if it's just some like, <laughs> if it's like out of spite, you know, <laughs> like that works, I think in order to go, okay, well, look, I would like to make a film that's about strength somehow, you know, like, and that, and so where, how can I make that? And this documentary I found, there's some strength in that and that's interesting and that's something I'd like to explore. Um, and yeah, but I don't know. And then, then it's about trying to make the best. Once you've settled on the topic, uh, well, well, once I've settled on kind of the themes or the idea, then it's about what's the form look like, which is it a doc? Is it a hybrid? Like what is the best fit? And then after that, and then if you can think about that for a while, if you get the concept right, like the, the assistant's a very simple concept. One day in the life, we thought about that and we got it working and then it's very easy to write. Like it took a few, I don't know, a couple of months to write because it was just like probably only a couple of weeks but months of, a month or two of fiddling with it. Um, once you kind of have the concept, it's not that difficult um, to kind of figure it out if the concept's strong, I guess. So then it kind of, that's sort of the way it, I do it and then just hope um, – hope it kind of comes together uh but yeah we're in that phase right now and julia wants to do a third one and we're so we're thinking well if we do a third one how do we what do we do how do we blow it up and make it different and so it's not just the same we're not making the same movie over and over again and um so that to me now is a sort of an inspiration i guess it's like going okay if i did a third one with julia like how could i like just completely turn it on its head you know which is fun thing to throw around and then figuring out what inspires me and that could fit into that kind of idea is something I guess that gets me going yeah I can't wait to see whatever that's going to be we'll see I mean she might refuse to be in it we'll see <laughs> it could be someone else you'll be like, and then you'll be able to tell that she refused <laughs> but yeah it's bold talk yeah I uh, I'm so sad to say we're out of time but um please do go and see if you haven't already the Royal or go and see it again the Royal Hotel 3rd of November uh in a few weeks and Kitty thank you so much thank, thank you. you so much thank you so much